uh, current COO of Amigo Games uh, North America. So we are the uh, North American arm of the German company Amigo Spiele. And uh, we are a company that publishes a number of games every year. You probably most know us from games like Saboteur, Bonanza, uh, or uh, if you're in the family, department, uh, family uh, category of games, things like Clack and Holly Golly. But, um, and previous to that, I worked with Steve Jackson Games for a couple of years and was active with Mayfair for a number of years, Mayfair Games uh, previous to that. So um, one of the, uh, today, I really want to just have a little bit of fun uh, and talk a little bit about, um, uh, I've renamed this thing a, a number of times during the development of it, but ultimately the goal of today is to talk a little bit about mechanical aspects or the toy element, uh, and it goes a little beyond that, but really mechanical and physical elements in the game that go beyond your typical board pieces. So I think, you know, we're all very familiar with how to use a board, uh, cards, although I have a whole seminar called 50 Ways to Use Cards in Games, um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of things that you can imaginatively use some of these pieces beyond, um, I think, you know, what, what traditionally has been used or what, you know, people comfortably or typically use cards or game pieces in general for. And, but beyond that, I think there's a real value in talking about um, about the, the, the kind of the toy element of games and the idea of what, what you can do to bring an extra element of kind of excitement and wow and, uh, and, and, and perhaps usefulness and, and game variability to your game as well using some of these props. Um, and and when I, I guess I want to go down this road carefully by stating that, you know, certainly as first-time designers, um, you may not, this, this may not be of interest to you, and this may be far beyond your field. Uh, the good news is, is you're working with companies that should have experience in being able to produce things like this, especially since, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later in the, in the talk, but in particular, uh, the things that I'm working with today um, are mechanical and in most cases physical. These are things that we're being able to put together with using just card stock and, and a little bit of injection plastic in some cases. So these are not difficult or challenging things for a company that that you know has expertise or that has or that, that has partners that have that this expertise to be able to put together. And the reason that we're talking about this is because certainly if you can include elements like this in your game, there's a wow factor to them. They're things that are going to, are going to certainly attract players, uh, whether those be you're at a convention and you have that on the table and people are attracted by the visual of that, or it's going to capture the imagination of somebody that sees that, that kind of element in your game and goes, wow, that sounds kind of cool. Uh, but you also have the flip side of that, which is these are the elements that are going to add cost and in some cases, significant cost to your game. So is it worth another $10 to the, to the final price of your game to include some of these things in it? So I not only want to talk about you know, some examples, and really today what I want to do is show some really interesting examples that illustrates uh, six different elements that I've identified, and these, it's not an exhaustive list, but it's six items that I think you can use this kind of element in your game design to improve it uh, for purposes of marketing, for improve it potentially for purposes of play, uh, to be able to consider why you would go down the road of adding something like this to your game and the, and the cost and the design and the development issues that come with it in order to make your game pop a little bit more. So um, one of the things that we, when we talk about, um, talk about these things is we're right now in really a golden age of component design and manufacture. There's just no way of getting around the fact that there are amazing things that you can do today that we couldn't do five years ago, 10 years ago, and going back beyond that. Um, just cardstock manufacture. Let's just talk about things like chipboard and cardstock. There are abilities for us to be able to print things. There are abilities to cut and laser cut and do things to put pieces that you've just never been able to do before to get both uh, uh, weird shapes to do different designs, uh, to do uniqueness. I think you know. Obviously, I think we've got we've got a, you know the really interesting example out there. Uh, playability may be another factor, but things like Keystone and Discover from Fantasy Flight, where you literally have a different game in every box, um, and that's a really interesting from a manufacturing standpoint, from a production standpoint, to kind of dig into those and say, hey, you know, this is really cool. How did they do it? You know, how do you come, get around the idea of I have a rule book for a game that 
is going to be totally different from the game that's in this other box. And how do you how do you do that? So, um, you know, Discover was like at eight dollars, I think, recently at Ollie's. And so I ran over there and bought three or four copies, not because I think the game is particularly good, but because I really wanted to kind of lay everything out and look at the stuff from an analytical standpoint and be able to say, wow, you know, how did they, how do I do this? How would I have done this better um, moving forward? Because really what they've given us is proof of, proof of concept, um, probably more than a game that anybody got really excited about. No offense, you can't see, but... <laughs> you know, it was, you know, but but I think I think as as something moving forward, it's a great opening statement of how you how something like this is going to look and how you can improve upon it, a foundation to work off for the future. So, when we talk about you know things that a lot of these things that we're going to talk about today are things that are tech that dates back twenty to you know twenty years in game design. So this is not this is known science. This is stuff that companies that are interested in doing this kind of thing are going to have a lot of access and examples to. And again, when we're talking about things like chipboard or cardstock, those are things we are very familiar with and we know how to work with them. We know what the you know, quality control looks like. Those are things that should be easy to kind of wrap our brains around. Plastics modeling has suddenly become accessible to small publishers. You know, in the past, the, the running gag was always, it's gonna cost you, you know, $15,000 for your first miniature, and it's cost you half a cent for the second one. Um, that price has come way down now. And, and the short runs that can be done now in some of these cases, uh, whether that be 3D printing or whether that be you know just short run plastics, you suddenly have the opportunity where everybody's throwing minis into a game, which is a whole other thing. But, uh, but, but at the end of the day, it's something that you can now actually consider as part of your game if it makes sense and if that if you think that there's value that will be brought to your game. Uh, if you have the opportunity to do that. And the tools for you as a game designer are becoming more accessible. They still not be, they're still not easy necessarily. You're not gonna be able to fire up CAD software. You know, you know that, that's, that's something that takes some knowledge and some design and some care to do correctly. But you are gonna have a lot larger pool of people to draw upon if you do need that kind of knowledge. Uh, and that stuff's gonna be able to be executed much easier than it would have been again five or 10 years ago. And finally, uh, 3D printing is, is, is still not where it needs to be for purposes of mass production, for purposes of being able to do 20 or 40 or 250,000 pieces of a game, but for purposes of some of prototyping and for purposes of some of the things that you can do, there are amazing things that you can do with that. And certainly, uh, you know, one of the great things about this today is this is, you know, this has a kind of a strong maker element uh, as part of this, uh, as part of the seminar track. And some of the people that are here, and if that's if that's a it's an area that's unfamiliar to you, I would encourage you to find some resources, find some friends that perhaps are type tapped into that network, because even there's a lot of almost print and play stuff you can now find on the you know you out to board game geek, you can find a variety of dice towers and holders and things like that that are literally just take the design, take it to your local you know maker shop, and they're going to be able to 3D print it for you. So as you as a designer start to think about some of these elements that you would like to see in your games, you have this really interesting community of people that have this technical knowledge to be able to bring something that could not, literally could not have been, had been made 10 years ago that you can now bring as far as internal structures or, or randomizers within a, a structure that you can now include as part of at least a prototype to be able to say this is a thing we could do if we can come around the technical aspects of how to make it happen. Uh, but 3D printing is an amazing tool, and I encourage you, again, that's a, that's a really interesting network if you can tie into something locally, if that's not something you are personally interested in, uh, that you may find really useful as you move forward in some of these, these ideas. So why include mechanical or physical element objects to your game? There are six reasons. I'm going to tell you five of them up front. I have a sixth one, and I'll say that to the end, and I'll tell you why later. But to just run down that list real quick. So toy value. The idea that you've got something that you can put in, so, in front of somebody that has this amazing ability to kind of draw you in and for, for you to play with it. So play is such an important part of, of the game experience and adding something that is a toy that, that literally has that kind of internal definition that this is something you can pick up and play with and, and work with and have this interaction with uh, it can be a really powerful tool uh, you think about something like you know one of the one of the best examples when I talk about teaching games is uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a game called Cash and Guns, but that is a game that you must explain the rules to, without having handed them 
the the tool they're going to be using during the game which is this foam gun because as soon as you've handed them this toy element as soon as you've handed them the toy gun that's it the next two minutes they're not going to listen to a word you say <laughs> they're just going to be handing the guns around and pointing to each other and you know doing their whole you know their little crazy thing and that's it you've lost them for two minutes so you know the idea that you teach the game and then and perhaps even do the reveal so you'll talk about the fact that we're going to have some money on the table and we'll have that money you know you'll be trying to get as much money as you can we're going to split that into groups you're going to have these cards which you know define the thing so what will happen is you'll kind of take a moment and then we're going to take our guns and of course at that point you now have everyone's undivided attention it's like oh we're going to get guns this is going to be fun you know so toy element is a really powerful tool in a lot in games that you can use to your advantage Table presence. The idea that you have something on a table that people are going to see and be gravitated, you know, that gravitate to. It's like, oh, that looks cool. What's going on over there? And come over to your game and, you know, kind of be interested in that experience just from the visual look of it. And you can do that with art, obviously, and with, you know, components and the way the game is laid out on a table. But having something sitting on a table that's, you know, three foot tall, you know, that, that's, you know two and a half foot tall and, and kind of interesting and there are game pieces on it. It's like, oh, that looks kind of cool. And, and you know, someone will come right over and suddenly they're, they're invested in your game before they know anything else about it. Providing drama to a design or to a step during gameplay. So the idea that this object is going to do something for you in gameplay to create a situation of tension to create this 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 climax this resolution to a game element and that's a really powerful thing so everyone's playing the game but they have in their head they have this focus that there's going to be this moment where the the, the thing is going to come out and is going to resolve the situation is going to provide information that's going to be really important to the gameplay so the idea of creating drama through an element or you know providing that kind of information Uniquely provides data or resolution to a design. So you have a tool that is going to give you information that's going to do randomization or is going to provide some piece of information to the game that allows the game to move forward that's going to inform players on what they should or shouldn't do. Fifth element, employ other senses in gameplay. We'll spend a little time on that. That's, I think, one of the more interesting elements is the idea that there are things you can do with a physical object that may allow you to use senses beyond those that you typically would do uh, when you're playing a game. And typically, of course, you're, you're, you're seeing things, you're talking, so there's, you know, there's those elements, but there are, there are senses that you'll be able to bring to bear, and we'll show you two. I'll, I'll, we'll have one to show you and one to talk about. Uh, that, are, that will give you the ability to bring a different sense forward in a game. Um, and again, a sixth element we'll come to later. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about digital apps and how a digital app will interfere. It, it goes a little beyond what I want to talk about today, but I do want to at least reference the idea. And I think there's a larger point that applies to both digital apps and what we do here. Is that it's great to have a digital app of a game. It's a chance for you to try the game out. You have a chance to maybe do some fun animations, to do some things that maybe attract people in the digital L, in the digital realm that will translate into physical sales. But one of the elements that a lot of digital apps are challenged by is the idea that what is your digital app, especially when you have games that require an app, what is your digital app doing that does better than what a physical implementation of that element would be. So if it rolls dice for you, great. Is it easier or faster than rolling dice on a table? You know, that's a decision to be made. Maybe if you're rolling 40 dice, it becomes easier to do that on an app. If you're rolling two dice, you know, that's maybe, that's maybe a wash. That's maybe a thing that you don't need a digital app for, depending on what other elements you have in your digital app. I think arguably there are things that I think digital apps will eventually do that will do very well. Um, for the moment, but you know, in both the case of these objects and digital apps, the element that I'm always asking is, what is this app doing that it does better or that a, a, that a physical game can't do? Uh, so there's an example I'll give you. Um, it's, it's, the game is not great, but it's, an inter it's a great example of perhaps an app that does something you can't do in the physical space, which is a game called Roar. Uh, European release, uh, I don't, it never came to the US. 
but the premise of the game is you have a monster and everyone else is playing scientists and the scientists are trying to narrow the board down in order to capture the monster, kind of Scotland Yard-esque. So it's kind of create the cord and, and try and, and trap the monster. The way the inf so if you're the monster, it's great. You have the app. You're looking on the board, and you see your monster kind of jumping up and down and stomping things and making dust clouds on the board. So you've got that kind of fun physical element that way. But what the app does that I think is really interesting is during the gameplay, what will happen is is during a round, you'll hit a button, and you will be presented with a soundscape. So you'll hear birds chirping. Maybe you'll hear some cars off the distance. And you'll hear um, like some, some music maybe over here, you know, uh, you know kind of mid-range. Mid so what you're now, you're looking at the board, you're looking for some place where you're going to hear birds singing, that maybe there's a construction site in a distance from where you're at, and music. So maybe that's like an outdoor cafe, or maybe there's like a, a bandstand, something, you know, stuff. So you're using the soundscape to narrow down positions on a board. And that's something that you, you know, that you literally physically can't do with the components of cardstock and, and dice and paper and, and, and things like that. So sound is a really powerful element. Um, if you've ever played, there's a game called U-Boat um, that is, is right now, as far as I'm concerned, the poster child for how to create, uh, how to use an app in a really atmospheric, really amazing way. Um, you're basically playing, you're, you're, it's, a, it's a cooperative where you're playing uh, U-boat. Uh, you all have different positions. So if you've played something like Captain Sonar or whatever, you have that experience of you're all kind of working together to keep your boat in operation. This goes well beyond that. This is a much more detailed. This is literally you're using, um, you know, depth charge tables. You're doing, you know, you're, you're using a lot of information that was literally part of these, of being on a, on a German U-boat to the point where the app in later, uh, in later scenarios will listen to the ambient sound in the room and if you are making too much noise, you are going to be heard and depth charges are going to start raining down on you. Right? And which, is just, which is just this amazing. I mean, if you want to have immersion into a concept, this game, and it's, 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 it was, it, I don't, I don't even, I'm not sure if it's even in print anymore because it, was a, it came with this amazing uh, substructure that you would build out of cardstock. Um, just a fascinating game. And, and the way that the app is used in that game is 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 an amazing, it's wonderful, and it's just, a, it's, if you have the experience to play that game, uh, especially if you're interested in the subject matter at all, uh, I highly recommend it, because it's, it's, it's quite an experience. What yes? You, it's actually you boot B-O-O-T, so you boat but you dash B-O-O-T. Uh, Phalanx Games in Poland was the primary publisher on that. So, so digital apps um, oftentimes are going to ask the same questions that these physical objects do, which is, what are you doing better? Why, why should I invest these tens of thousands, you know, the ten thousand dollars to create an app for this game, if I can have something, you know, if, if it, what is it going to do that goes beyond the stuff that I can do with, you know, fifty cents worth of cardstock? All right, so. What I want to do now is go through each of those objects and talk about a, a game that I think illustrates an example of those things really well. So when we talk about toy value, um, I'm going to plug my own company at least once during this thing. Uh, so we have a game called Magic Mountain. So this is a sloped game, so it's a card stack, it's a double board. So it's a, it's a single board and then a, a board that's been overlaid on top of it with a cutout. Uh, the game is basically you are racing witches down a hill. So you have good witches, which start up here, and bad witches, which have starting spots along here. And during the game, we have five marbles, five different colors. Those colors correspond with the five colors we see on this path that goes down. And I'm going to wrap this thing up early, so you have a chance to come up and look and touch and play with some of these things. So don't feel too, too uh, worried if you can't see a lot of what I'm talking about or you can't see the detail. Uh, I'm going to give everyone a chance to come up and play with this stuff before we're done. Uh, so the object of the game is you're going to draw one of these marbles out. It's a cooperative game. You're trying to get four of these good witches to the bottom before three of the bad witches come to the bottom. Drop a marble on one of these six starting paths, and anything that the marble touches will move that witch, good or bad, to the next space of that color on the path. All right? So you think about something like Fireball Island, which has, again, for toy value, there's nothing like watching all of that stuff on the board and, the, and, the, and your Volcar, you know, the big, big idol on there, rolling those marbles down. 
Um, I like to think that this game actually has some really interesting elements that that game doesn't, in the sense that at first it's like, oh, you roll the marble and it hits and you're moving stuff down, that's great. About mid-game, you realize that there's some really interesting logic gate puzzles that this game presents to you. You have all of these, these you know, one, two gates that you're, you're going to encounter. What, what will be the ramifications of a marble that goes through this set of gates versus this set of gates? Um, you have an interesting gameplay of saying, well, maybe I'm going to try and get the bad witches. I'm going to maybe deliberately hit them to move them to this side of the board so that this side of the board is clear so I can move good witches down this side of the board. And so suddenly you have this really interesting puzzle that goes on that goes beyond just the simple drop value of stuff. So this is a game where the toy value is important. You're dropping the marbles and it's still a lot of fun to have that experience and kids especially can have that experience without necessarily focusing on the gameplay element. But for adults, this becomes a really interesting 15 minute kind of marble roller where you have actual decisions that, that are going to be, you know, they're going to be randomized by the gravity of the stuff dropping but suddenly is really a game in how you want to try and manipulate these pieces to get them down to the bottom. And this is a great example of, this is a game that took almost two and a half years, I think, to develop. Um, not because the concept, of course, is really simple, but we started this as, a, it was originally a plastic molded board, and we decided that we didn't like the way that, they, that marbles would come down and hit those plastic points. Uh, became, it, it seemed like it was too consistent, that it would hit and move one direction all the time. So by doing this in cardstock, we're able to do a sharper point, which means that it, we're going to get, and, and we get a little more rebound on it. So it hits, kind of bounces for a second and thinks about, well, it could go down this way, it could go down this way. And this game is going to change a little bit as you, as you play it more and more, and you get a little bit of wear on those points. And suddenly those points may not behave the way they have always behaved, behaved in the past. So getting this right took a lot of time, but it created some really interesting and some gameplay advantages that we would have had if we had just said, ah, oh, we'll just do some pl molded plastic and call it a day. So Magic Mountain, great example of toy value that still, that still allows you to have an interesting game attached to it. So it's not just toy for the sake of toy. All right. Next up, uh, table presence. Skyrunner. Um, and I, I, I should have been holding up, uh, yeah, so for example, that is our... That's our Magic Mountain from Amigo Games. So Skyrunner goes back to a very early game. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move this glass of water from our previous presenter out of the way because I don't wanna get water in my stuff. I don't wanna get water in the computer stuff either, but it's unlikely to get dropped there. Um, Skyrunner. So this is, um, what's the year on this one? Uh, I wanna say it's 2000. So 20 year old game at this point. Um, but this, is, this was the element. This was the thing that everybody saw on a table and said, I want to learn more about that game. Um, again, it's, it's, and it's a simple structure. So we have three plastic triangles. They are set in such a way that they basically sit on top of the level that's underneath it. In the case of these two, you inset then two pieces of cardstock that have been punched in and in one case scored. So they sit in the groove. So and so. So it creates a very stable structure for purposes of the gameplay. And the game itself is, is simple. You have cards, you play them, and they allow you to move your pieces, which are actually little hanging uh, climber guys. They go into the little plug, the holes there. And so that's your board as you actually are playing on this vertical board uh, moving up. So the game itself, you know, you certainly you could, do, you could have done a 2D on a board representation of a tower that you're moving up. But... It is interesting, you know, this, this gives you the toy value, certainly the table presence of saying, wow, look at this thing that sits on a board, or sits on the table and kind of brings, the, you know, brings people to it. And you also have an interesting element of the 3D aspect of it, so the idea that maybe you're going to put your piece over on this side so that that person can't see your piece uh, until you move around to this side and come up, or whatever the case may be. So... Uh, so there's structurally some reasons why this works better than just a 2D element, but again, for toy presence in, in you know, 2000 when I was kind of discovering a lot of the Euro games, uh, I bought a copy of this literally based on that tower sitting on a table one day at, at a show, and it's, it's, uh, it's a great example of, again, a very simple, a very simple to manufacture thing that creates a very, you know, a very powerful statement on a table. So drama. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna 
Oh, let me get this piece back in there so I can take this in one piece off. So, Reiner Knizia has often been accused of being sort of the, the uh, you know, sort of the, the primary producer of auction games. And a game that, that has kind of fallen off a lot of people's radar, but was one of the auction games that I found just fascinating, was a game called Merchants of Amsterdam. So this has, at its core, a really interesting little toy. So this is a Dutch auction. Uh, so you have items that you are trying to buy that you were hoping to buy for as cheap as possible and then actually make money off of. But the mechanism that is used to do this is this nifty little clock. So the way this works is when it comes time to do an auction, we are going to take our little hand here, we're going to crank this up, and what you have is a dial that simply says, um, hang on a second, uh, it's, you know, starts at 200, 190, 180, 170, 160 on down. And so to start an auction, and whenever somebody hits that, that's the price they pay. <laughs> so, so you have this, so, so everyone's sitting on the table, listening to the sound, watching this dial go down and down, and who's going to be the first one to grab it and going to pay the price that they, they hit it at. So, it's a, it, so, so not only does it serve an important function in the game to set a price for an auction and to do so in a timing way and do so without an app or, you know, a client, and it's certainly, you could do the same thing with a, a phone sitting on the table if you don't mind four people hitting your phone as fast as you can. Um, but, but, but even, I would, I would argue that even that sound adds tension and drama to this experience of when you're going to hit that and, and, and end the auction and, and have somebody buy it. So this is, this is a really powerful little tool, and it probably hasn't been reprinted again because this is such a, a critical part of the experience. But again, we're not talking about anything electronic here. We are talking about a simple wind-up toy like you'd find in any, you know, any wind-up cars or anything like that that's just been repurposed to create this timer uh, experience. So Merchants of Amsterdam, uh, as far as for something that adds drama, so, you know, so everything you do during the game leads up to this auction and this experience, and it's something everyone looks forward to, and it's just a really cool little element that's included in this game. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You do that little that little half move and force someone else to go on something you don't want. Oh yeah. So it's a great so the the actual and a, and a lot of these cases, these aren't games that really kind of exploded onto the scene. Uh, Magic Market, may, Magic Mountain may very well be the exception to that, but but again, I think the, these games went beyond what may have been their original market, based on some of these elements existing. So the next one I have is a really deep cut, um, and it, it's it's a game that I don't think really did. Uh, there's some there's some issues with the game, including some pretty problematic art, to be honest. Um, but I've never seen this element in any other game. And it's an element that I, it, it's one of those that I, I feel like it could inspire somebody to do something similar that would be really cool. Um, but I'll show you the way this one works. This is a game called Trilla Stilla. So it's a basically, uh, you're, 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 uh, you're, you have bands that you're managing that you're trying to uh, uh, put into, you know, trying to raise, you know, get, get a number one hit with. So you have a board, you have bands, you're in charge of bands based on color. Um, and I'm going to be off, I'm going to have to bring some of this stuff up here. But this is a really, this is, this is, like I said, it's kind of a weird thing. But the way this works is everyone is issued a color and you have one of these little sleeves. Um, this almost acts like a voting sleeve. So for the people that have had that experience, um, you will draw chips out of a bag. And these chips are basically numbers, positive or negative. So you'll have a handful of these little wooden chips that have values one to four, red, you know, red negative, black positive. And you have a board that sits in your little sleeve that corresponds to the 14 slots that we have on the board where the, where the bands sit. So privately, you will take your chips and you will place them, whoop, you'll place them in, in your little sleeve like this. 
uh, in whatever five spots you want them to be in. So like so, I've got my little five, five little discs there. I'm going to close the sleeve up. So now it's relatively stable. And then there's a person who's kind of in charge. So once everyone does this, and it plays, I think, up to six players, they're going to take this little apparatus. And we put the, actually, we have to put the other piece on here first. Uh, I have another peg. Do I leave my wooden block over there? <laughs> There's a reason for the very, there's all these little awkward bits and pieces to deal with, but. All right. So this slips down over here, and I need to get this line back up. I have a peg here. I feel like I'm missing a piece. Anyway. Um, is what? All right, we may just uh, we may just be bully on without. I feel like there's another another wooden piece I am missing. But anyway, so this peg kind of goes in here, and it, it basically is guidance to get this lined up on your thing. So everyone has their bits that they do. So they, they, everyone one by one puts their sleeve on there. We're going to pull it out, and all the little chips now fall into the chambers in this little wooden piece here. And then there's a resolution phase where we put, a, put the numbers on here. There's a... <laughs> I appear to have been woefully unprepared for this particular game. <laughs> but, no, there's a whole stack of stuff that I didn't... Is that the podium? Yeah. Yeah. So we'll have a whole stack of these then that have been put onto the, the thing as each player puts their own set of discs on there. Then we're finally going to put this on top. We're going to put our little peg on here. And now we're going to rotate based on gameplay. And as we hit pieces that have fallen into the chamber, they're supposed to fall out the bottom. Oh, because I'm not moving that. There we go. So there. So what happens is, as you rotate this piece, the little tokens fall out of the chambers as you move along. So it provides sort of hidden data, and it also provides a bit of randomization of who has provided what data into each of those chambers. So I apologize. That one wasn't as clean a presentation as I had hoped for. But conceptually, so like I said, this is a game that didn't do spectacularly well. But I, I, I've never seen anything that used kind of that voter sleeve element of being able to produce, you know, put information into the sleeve, drop it into a randomized area, and then provide uh, discrete groups of information like that by coming, you know, by, by falling out the end of the, the bottom of that wooden piece. So it's, a, it's an interesting element. Again, this is a game that didn't, I, I, I can honestly say, did not do very well. Uh, at least it certainly didn't really make an impact into the U.S. market, but interesting game, interesting toy element. So the next one is one I think is really, is one I'm, I'm kind of excited about, which is the idea of using other senses in games. So the first one I'm going to talk about is a game I don't have with me, and it's because it doesn't travel, because it's kind of large and awkward, and, and all of that, but it's one of the best games of its type that I've ever run across, and it's a game called The Touch. Currently out of print, it's been out of print for almost 10 years at this point. But on the table, what I want you to imagine is kind of this domed chamber, kind of UFO style, that's gonna sit here on the, on the table, and it is filled with plastic toy things. So you have like animals in here, like little plastic animals, and little plastic monuments, and little plastic, you know, other objects. So you have a whole chamber of these things inside our little dome. And the goal of the game is you're given a card that says, find the giraffe in the Eiffel Tower. And now you're going to plunge your hand into this and you're trying by feel to find the, those, two, those two, you know, those two plastic toys 
in this chamber of all of these toys that are in the UFO. Now that in and of itself is kind of a cool game. And every, you know, you've got a certain amount of time to be able to pull those things out. The really smart thing they did with that is that this side of the dome is clear plastic. So you are playing and trying to find these things. Everyone else gets the show of your hand in the chamber <laughs> trying to find them. And that's the thing that makes the game really exciting for people. Because it's not just this black box experience of trying to reach in there and get stuff, but you actually can see how close, how they're digging into it, and the Eiffel Tower is sitting right on top of their hand, and they're, you know, all they have to do is reach the hand back and pull up and then fight. You know. So that element of the fact that it gives people the chance to see the experience is what makes that game work as well as it does. Again, um, it's, it's, it, you see them come up on eBay and, and whatnot, and they're not super expensive, but it's a really, you know, and there were booster packs, so you could add new toys <laughs> to it and kind of go through that whole thing. Uh, but it, was a, it, it did, it, it, for purposes of exploring the sense of touch in a game, it's one of the best examples, and it's one of the most entertaining, again, because of the smartness of adding that clear window to the back of their chamber. The other game, exploring the sense of sound, is a game called Mord Imorosa. And this game has a good kind of table presence element to it as well, as what you are building to start the game is a, basically you're building a hotel. So you have these different floors, so you basically close up the box, and now, and each of these floors are basically just a little, little half box with a hole cut in them. And so to build your play space, and, and they're actually, they're actually got a, a pasted piece on top that creates this hole, but also gives you a little bit of an inset for each of these levels as it goes up. So they actually set really nicely on each other. And you'll note as well, they are labeled, so you actually have identification for which floor we are talking about as we go up here. I, was, I, I almost bought this, I bought this game not because of the theme or the toy presence or anything else, but we actually stayed, when we go to Essen, we stayed at the Hotel La Rosa. So it was murder at the hotel we stayed at. Woo! So, um, <laughs> but, so this, is your, this is your play board. And during the course of the game, you're trying to basically solve a murder in its most abstracted form because it rep they're represented, two murders actually, they're represented by two red cubes uh, in, this, in this tower. So effectively, the way the gameplay works is you are allowed to explore a floor. So you'd pull it off and say, I'm going to explore level, you know, this, this or floor three. So you pull it off. You see what cubes are on this floor. I'm going to take those cubes off the floor. And I'm now going to drop them one by one into the top of this tower. And so I am now listening as each of these cubes go in the tower to see how many floors it may drop down in order to be able basically to build up a set or to try to identify which level those red cubes will eventually end up on. So the goal of the game is to listen for those cubes as they took, 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 took down. And of course, they may hit other cubes and other cubes may fall down. So you're trying to listen for collisions, which may create uncertainty into what's, what's happening. But ultimately, you're trying to be able to say, I'm going to try and solve murder. I believe the red cube is on this level. We open it up and boom, there's your red cube. And you, you've scored, you know, you've done one of the successful elements of the game. But I think this was a, this was a game that I, I found really interesting for purposes of, again, you, you create environments uh, with this game that game can, you know, that has to be played in. So you, this, is a, this is a hard game to play at a convention because it's a very loud environment. So you need a certain amount of quiet. You need a certain amount of being able to listen carefully to hear those, those cubes as they fall down. But for something that, again, uses a sense of sound in a game that doesn't involve an app or something that generates sounds, this is a great example of how you can kind of use that mechanism uh, to create that. And there are other there are other games that you can I, you know that you can uh, point at. So, for example, there's a game called Vampire Hunter, which I pull out every every Halloween, which is great, which uses uh, red blue. So basically, you start the game and you play it in a pitch black room, uh, other than the light that's generated by a tower that sits in the middle of the board. And it and you're in the day phase. It ha it casts a red light, which you have a board that you're moving pieces around. It's a pretty it's almost a pretty typical role and play style game. 
uh, for purposes of that. But at some point it goes to night phase, you hit the tower and it goes from a red light to a blue light. And of course the board has been red, blue printed in such a way that now the board is completely different. And now you're, you've got a whole different set of tracks and pieces and things that you're working with. And the, uh, yeah, again, it's just a physical, you know, light change within, within the tower, but you create a really interesting game experience based on the ability of what light you see from, you know, whether it's the red light or the blue light that's shining on the board. Um, those are, so that's five of the six things that I, I wanted to touch on as far as examples of games, uh, of components and games that I think, you know, illustrate those, those five pieces. The sixth one, interestingly enough, I had written it down when I was creating the, the seminar notes for this, is accommodation of disability. Um, the, the idea that you can create a tool within a game that is going to be accessible, that's going to be interesting for everyone to use, it's going to be a physical object that, that all players can use, but will allow your game to have a larger audience based on being able to overcome some physical aspect uh, that might not other, you know, and this is something you run into a lot with games like dexterity games or games that have small pieces or games that have, you know, kind of issues with that. And interestingly enough, I, I went through, I know I have 2,300 games sitting at home mm -hmm. and I, I, I racked my brain, I looked at my board game list and I really couldn't come up with a good example of a game that produces, a, that has a kind of a toy element piece that I think really exemplify the ability that, that this piece is there to kind of provide accommodation. And, and, and it's not necessarily a surprise. I think this is something that has been, you know, even, even something as simple as being able to accommodate colorblindness is something that I really think, you know, I think has really only come to the forefront in the last decade or so. Uh, you know, that you would take that into account as part of the game design and the pieces that you're working with. So I think thinking about accommodation for disability is something that uh, that I don't think a lot of people have put a lot of, you know, publishers, uh, publishers in particular, that put a lot of effort or thought into, but it's an interesting, the fact that I couldn't come up with an idea is both a little embarrassing and really interesting. Yes? Nyctophobia, yes. So, so that's an example, I think, uh, and, and it kind of comes at it from a different angle where we say, yes, this is a game that was designed for, for someone that, that, that was you know, functionally blind and give them the opportunity to play the game uh, in an environment that they did not have to see the, the board. And I think that's a great example of a game that, that kind of uses that. Um, the thing that, the, the, you know, so in my sense, you know, I think, I think the game is accessible to anybody. And that's, I think, a beautiful example of that. Um, in, in my case, a lot of this was trying to isolate an object within a game experience. Um, and, but Nyctophobia is absolutely an example of a game that was literally designed from the ground up with that, al with that element in mind. But I find it interesting that we haven't come up with an element. And we have individual things you can buy. So, for example, a card holder for people that may not have the ability to hold cards easily. Um, you know, you have, you know, and you, so you have some things like that that have been uh, sold as accessories that allow people to, you know, like a, even something as simple as like the tile holder in Scrabble, because obviously you can't, hold, you know, you could have a handful of chips that you're holding in your hand, but that's a lot less awkward, or a lot less awkward to just have them lined up on a tile. Yeah. I don't know the name of the game, but there's games where uh, you're essentially stacking uh, little wooden pieces or plastic pieces or something like that, and you're supposed to uh, while you have a headband that has uh, a peg that comes off of it with a hook. Mm -hmm. You have to use only your neck in your head to pile something that is an arrangement that's given to you in a card or something. Okay, yeah, I, I, I vaguely remember a, a game, yeah, like that, where, yeah, you're kind of, we're kind of craning stuff onto it based on being able to move your head like that. Um, yeah, it, it just, it, it struck me, it was just interesting that no one had designed a game that perhaps you know, would be able to, you know, that, that you had this element that would say, you know, rather than pick up a piece or manipulate a piece or, you know, be doing some sort of fine-tuned move of a piece, that there would be a tool or an object provided that would be able to do that, that might let people that otherwise wouldn't be able to do that, you know, participate in that game as well. Something that kind of broadened the, the scope of the game. And so, for me, that becomes an opportunity. That becomes, hey, that's a really interesting kind of concept to kind of wrap my brain around. Again, that's less a game design thing and more of a, a sort of a concept of, 
of you know an object or a, or a manufacture element, but it's something that, that I think now it's suddenly on my radar a little bit to say, huh, you know, if I encounter something like that, or what can I look at in, 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 in tools as we do with game design, you know, what, what, what is in my environment that I use that makes my job easier, lets me do something I wouldn't otherwise be able to do, is there a, some sort of analog that I can bring into the game design world that lets me do that? Then. I guess to leave the, the general, before we go into just general questions, um, if you want to have a really interesting design experience to kind of explore some of this, this headspace, um, I would really recommend you look at carnival games, especially like turn of the century stuff, some of the, the games, some of the, the, the mechanisms that you'd find on a, on a carnival midway, you know, that goes back to like, you know, the, the late 1800s or early 1900s. Um, you have this, this amazing variety of games that have been created that were designed to kind of attract people in and, you know, make them give you some money and, and, and have some sort of short play experience. Um, and, and mostly through physical or mechanical means rather than electronic means. Um, and, and I think that there's a, there's a lot of really interesting, you know, it's kind of fertile ground to dig around. So, for example, like Kabuto, uh, Kabuto uh, Sumo. Uh, which has just been released. I mean, if you can't see the, the pusher machine that, that inspired that game, and I saw a design that used that kind of pusher machine me mechanism 10 years ago and just didn't have the, the physical vibe. I think Kabuto Sumo does that really, really well uh, of, creating, of creating that, that existence. But, but, you know, we don't have uh, something that, you know, replicates, for example, you know, the claw machine, you know, skee ball. There's a lot of those, those kind of arcade <laughs> midway games that may not translate one-to-one -one into, into a game space, you know, game, game design space, but, but, are, but are things that have classically attracted people to play them and to give people money in order to play them. And which is kind of where we are with game design. We kind of like somebody to be attracted to your game and to pay money in order to play, you know, to, to buy a copy of the game in order to play it. So that is, that's really the information that I wanted to, you know, we can talk about things in general and actually it's the 10 minute mark. So at this point, I'm going to just stop talking. If you've got questions, uh, I'll take them and I'll kind of be loud about it. But if you want to come up and touch and feel any of this stuff before I pack it up, you got about five minutes to do so. So I'm going to let you, I'm just going to end things now. Thank you very much. If you want to, again, questions, I'll try and answer them loudly if, if, they're, if there's something we can, you know, share with the group. But otherwise, if there's any of these things you want to come up and touch, please do so. And thank you. Hey, Alex, do you have any good examples of using electronics in games, like LED lights? Or? Um... Less, a lot of them, a lot of the ones that I have seen have been more awkward than I think useful. Um, again, things things that the, that a, an app does best is to collate a lot of information quickly. Not apps. Things quickly. like stop key for dark tower. Oh yeah, um, you know, and, and, and there have been a, a certain amount of them that kind of do the kind of the, the storyline randomization. I think you know, the apps that provide the dungeon master in a dungeon game. Uh, th those are nice because it allows, it allows a player to have a player experience as opposed to requiring one player to have a, um, to be a different kind of player. Uh, so those are the kind of things that I think are, are really good about apps. Um, as far as good examples, again, I kind of didn't focus on the Google side because it really, it, it, it's a very much, there's a lot of information there. And there are probably people that speak to it much better than I. I'm very much kind of an outsider in that world, but uh, uh, there's definitely, it's definitely stuff out there, you know, examples of it. But as far as, as, far as you know, things that have impressed me as a player, you know, uh, you, you've got two, two, two candidates there with Roar and Vivo. Roar reminds me of yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, my burning question is: so you, um, I, I feel like there's there's been a whole lot of pressure over the last you know four or five years to be like MSRP to do all you can to bring down MSRP for for these games you're designing. Yeah. And now you're showing us all these really cool, great components, <laughs> and that's. You know, increasing MSRP. This is a twenty-five dollar game. So that, that's a really good example of, I, I think, you know, how you can do this without MSRP. But you know, um, 
I, uh, is it true that like you know um, trying to um, bring down MSRP to, to appeal to, to to the broader audience who would enjoy these types of things is seems it, like it's in conflict with introducing all these cool components, but then it, it might price out the exact audience you're trying to target. The the the, the thing that you're keeping in mind is always what is the upside of adding this element to a game? Uh, what is am I going to sell more? And, and, and that's really, really the decision to make is that if I take a game from a $25 game to a $35 game, but I'm able to add an element that people are just going to, you know, kind of blow their minds with, uh, and that, that's going to maybe sell another five to 10,000 copies of game based on that table presence or based on that toy value, then, then that, that to a, a publisher is going to have to make that decision in a sense. But, but the publisher has, I think, the information to be able to decide if their market can bear another five or ten dollars added to the cost of the game. Again, you're, you're not just arbitrarily adding this stuff to a game. Everything that I've shown here, that, that element is both integral to the game and enhances the gameplay in some way. And that's always what you're looking for when you talk about something like this. Is it's not just something that you are putting out there to say, oh, and it's got this toy in it. You know, or it's, you know, and, and, and certainly the poster child for that is, oh, it's got this mini in it. Mm. You know, <laughs> you're always trying to find a way to say that this is not only cool, but it's useful in gameplay. Any other questions? I have one question. Yeah. With toys and like toy value stuff, uh, you have a tendency to things wear out, especially if you're building like 3D objects from like hardware components. Yes. I mean, do you have any thoughts or opinions on like how to mitigate that, or like, what sort of the process is in like testing out how long things will last? Yeah, you are you are in a position of knowing that there is a certain amount of planned abs ab uh, um, obsolescence to your game. Uh, if you, you know something like Magic Mountain, this is designed to be useful over a long period of time. Uh, it is, however, going to wear out if a four-year-old is, you know, gonna, gonna hammer this game and do things, you know, do the things that they do to anything that they add with their four-year-old. Uh, so, so there's gonna be a certain amount of wear. So price becomes a part of it. So this is not, you know, if, if this is somebody's favorite game at four, it may not be their favorite game at six. So they may age out of it. If, if it wears out $25 for a favorite game, probably, you know, in, in a couple of years, <laughs> is it a huge investment in, in money and, in money, and so, so really, it's again, it's a balancing act of saying, um, you know, is this piece going to wear? So, for example, Merchants of Amsterdam, I have three copies of that because I, and I, although I haven't had any of those timers break down yet, I just know it's going to, they're going to fall apart. Someone's going to hit it too hard, and I'm no longer going to have that piece, and it's going to then be an unusable game. So I, you know, so I wanted to have backups of that of that piece, so that when, it, I, I, in my head, it's always when it happens, not if it happens. Uh, I'm ready. I, I won't have a, a use. You know, I'll have another copy ready to go, so I can continue to play it. But yes, you know, anything anything with toy value, anything that is designed to be touched and moved and used and hit and, and all those things are things that are going to wear out. And how easy is it? Do you sell those pieces separately on your website? So can I buy that, you know, a, a particular piece separately to replace that, similar to like a, a pad and a roll and write game? If those are available for, for someone to do, it makes it an easier sell to say, yes, it may wear out, but you know, send us 10 bucks and we'll fire up, uh, you know, we'll just send you a new piece to replace it. Ah, they found the, they found the little hanger pieces, yeah. Any other questions? All right. I will see you around the next couple of days, but thank you very much for your attention today.